Good morning. My name is Dylan Reynolds. I'm a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Guelph. And today I'm going to be sharing some preliminary findings uh, related to my dissertation. My pre presentation discusses victims' perspectives of identity theft protection. So I'll start by briefly outlining this presentation. I'll start with an introduction to identity theft and the study and methods of this research. I'll then discuss the responsibility for identity theft protection. So most victims understand identity theft is a complex issue that needs attention from multiple institutions and actors. But they also describe the individual's own responsibility for protecting their identity and their accounts. Next, I'll discuss security practices described prior to these identity theft incidents. Almost all victims describe some practices prior um, to being victimized, with many of them being quite technologically savvy. Finally, I'll discuss changes in the aftermath of identity theft described by the victims. So these range from very general practices like increasing account monitoring to extremely specific practices related to the, related to the unique incident experience. So to introduce, um, according to all estimates that I'm aware of, identity theft continues to increase in North America. Some of the most recent victimization estimates suggest 10% of adults are victimized annually. Now this figure is American, but it's a 2016 large scale survey. The costs of identity theft to individual victims are vast, but they can include losses of time, money, as well as emotional, physical, and even relational consequences in some cases. And little is known about how victims themselves think about these incidents because there's been minimal qualitative studies of identity theft in North America. Now, online and offline forms of identity theft are sometimes difficult to distinguish. In fact, past research finds victims are often unsure of how their information was even taken. Examples of online forms could include hacking or phishing, where offline forms could include stealing physical cards, so identification cards or credit cards, um, or dumpster diving for confidential documents. So here, identity theft is defined in line with the US National Crime Victimization Survey's Identity Theft Supplement. That's a mouthful, but it's a large scale survey um, and the definition includes one, the misuse of an existing account. So it includes banking and credit card fraud, as well as another account. So that can include telecom accounts, utilities, or online retailers, et cetera. Two, the creation of a new account in the victim's name. So this is often um, applying for, sorry, opening a credit product um, in somebody else's name in order to access funds or goods. And then third, other fraudulent misuses of personal information. It's a bit of a catch-all, but it includes things like applying for government benefits in somebody else's name or personating somebody to a police officer even. So methods. I conducted in-depth interviews with victims of identity theft in Southern Ontario. They started uh, as in-person interviews and then switched to phone interviews when restrictions necessitated. Um, the interviews ask questions about how the incident impacted them, how they dealt with it, and how they think about the incident and its resolution. So part of my interest is how these victims perceive the incident itself, be it as crimes, inconvenient events, or just inevitable consequences of advanced technological payment systems. Participants were recruited through not-for-profit family and financial counseling centers and online through the use of Reddit. So as can be seen, most participants experienced the misuse of an existing account. Some reported multiple incidents here. So 10 reported the misuse of an existing credit card, while three reported misuse of an existing bank account, and eight reported the misuse of another existing account. So this included phone accounts, music streaming services, online retailers, um, loyalty points, and, and others. A couple experienced the creation of new accounts, while a couple others had uh, unique fraudulent misuses of their personal information. But in total, only 12 participants were even fairly certain of how their information was obtained. So less than, or just over half, sorry. 
So the interviews start by discussing the participants' own experience. But after I discuss their specific, or we discuss their specific incident, I ask them a hard question. Whose responsibility is identity theft or the misuse of accounts? I find that many participants have a really good understanding of these complex issues um, and the many institutions that can be involved in it. So I think this is a really great quote from a victim of new account fraud. First, they laugh and they say they have no idea, which is a product of a hard question, but they go on. How much more can the institutions that give credit do? When does it become each individual person's responsibility? Is it about providing more proactive education or better resources that are more reactive? Is it the government's because it's a crime and it's increasing in prevalence? So I think, like most things, it's probably a combination of all of it. I really like this quote since it clearly shows a solid understanding of this complex issue, but it wasn't unique to this participant. Others talked about complex ideas like jurisdictional issues for policing online incidents and things like that. Overall, these participants were very knowledgeable about the issues. Now, most victims say they expect that institutions, banks, credit card companies, online retailers, are doing a lot to avoid being breached, hacked, or otherwise allowing for personal information to be compromised. But many of the people I talk to still end up emphasizing the individual's responsibility. So a victim of an online account fraud says, I think it's both the individuals and the companies who we registered for accounts online. So they should kind of set up a new way to change your password frequently. Now, in this case, they suspected their password was compromised. But similarly, a victim of credit card fraud says, I think it's primarily your own responsibility to keep track of your finances and your cards. That's your money. You worked hard for it. And then, yeah, reporting it to police because they're the ones who have the tools to solve these things. And obviously, that changes based on the incident. But then if, if it's the case that these victims understand they have some responsibility in these incidents, the next question is, what security practices did they implement before these incidents? I'm going to start by talking about monitoring and account monitoring. Monitoring. So account monitoring is a, is a common way people notice identity theft incidents. So other ways could include getting a call from your bank that they flagged something odd, or getting denied for a loan when you expect it to be approved. But routine monitoring is a common way of noticing identity theft. So it came up a lot in these discussions. And monitoring practices vary. One participant noticed the unauthorized transaction within 24 hours because they check their account daily for new transactions. They say as soon as they wake up. Another participant, a victim of bank fraud, mentioned, however, that, quote, now that I think about it, it had been six months since I checked my statements. That doesn't happen anymore. But clearly, monitoring practices vary widely and based on many factors. So the most common practices participants described implementing, even prior to these incidents, include monitoring accounts, checking online banking and balances regularly, only using trusted websites and trusted payment systems, although interestingly, what websites and payment systems people see as trusted varies. Being careful with scams and phishing attempts, so both emails and phone calls, and text messages, I guess, as well. Being diligent with passwords, and then using two-factor authentication where possible. But an important note is that I was not asking participants to list all practices that they used prior. I wasn't asking closed-ended questions, like, did you do this, yes or no? Instead, these are things that the participant brought up. So it's possible that some practices mentioned by one participant are actually used by other participants, but they just didn't think of it at that time, right? This isn't an exhaustive list. But I think the main takeaway here is that this can happen to even those who have fairly strict security practices already. Several participants identify as technologically savvy. Others have jobs in or related to computing. It's not as if these victims are generally careless. So what about security practices in the aftermath of these incidents? Before I get to that, I'm going to go off on a bit tangent, but a, a bit of a tangent, but I promise it'll reconnect. 
I start these interviews by asking about what happened. And I hear in these stories about stress. I hear about monetary losses. I hear about emotional impacts, including varying ranges of distress, anger, feelings of a lack of control over one's life, and even sometimes relational consequences. But then after that, I ask the participants, generally, how would you say this experience impacted you? And my goal with this is having them identify to me what consequences were important to them. Obviously, the answers to this range. Some are relatively mundane, um, with a victim of an account fraud saying, honestly, it was stressful the day of, but I had complete faith in the companies because it was clearly not my fault. Or another says, I think it was stressful, like quite stressful, added to my weekly stress box, you know how we can only deal with a certain amount. Now, I forget if this interview was prior or since the pandemic, but it's certainly something that may bring even more true now. And then they will, there were some more serious responses, like this from somebody who was victimized by someone close to them. I never really trusted the perpetrator after that. But what else is interesting to me, and connecting it back, is even when I ask what the impact is generally, several volunteer behavioral changes or lessons learned with respect to their security. A victim of new account fraud whose information was compromised through phishing says, okay, first of all, I learned a lot of lessons, mostly about sharing my personal details. A victim of another fraudulent misuse says, I'd say I'm a lot more careful with who I share my information with, especially anything that can be linked to an account. And finally, a third participant responded to this general question by saying, I think that it made me more careful of how I choose my passwords. I make my passwords stronger. So then I ask a follow-up question about behavioral changes or new practices implemented specifically. After an identity theft incident, behavioral changes can be general or specific to the incident. So general strategies are often aimed at securing identity information from being taken in the first place um, or noticing it quicker, like monitoring accounts. But it can also include being more diligent with password securities uh, and being more careful with scams and phishing emails. Strategies may also be implemented that are specific to the form of identity theft experienced. For example, putting more security on a specific account. So some victims may go to the company where their account was compromised and ask for added security or ask for a note to be put on their account to try to prevent it from happening in, in the future. Some victims report being more careful with storing credit cards, particularly those whose physical card was misused. And then finally, another offline example, some victims report shredding documents more securely if they suspect that their information was compromised through documents. I'm going to read one quote related to this, just because I love the Seinfeld reference. This was a participant who was a victim of credit card fraud, where the perpetrator misused the physical card. They say, I did actually go and get one of those big George Costanza wallets. So now if my wallet is not in my pocket, I immediately know as opposed to going to two hours without noticing it's missing. I like this quote, but I also think it's a good example of a practice that I wouldn't have even thought to ask about if I was designing closed-ended questions. So next, for victims that know their offender, they describe monitoring accounts more um, to see if there's further issues. But additionally, they're more likely to take action to secure their information and control what the specific individual responsible has access to. So when asked if they made any behavioral changes related to their accounts or identity information, a victim of banking fraud responds, no, not specifically for my behaviors towards the tangible account. It was my behaviors towards the perpetrator that changed. There's a psychology there where I can't look at them the same way I used to. I'm almost on a defensive now. But overall, the most common practices implemented after these incidents include changing password habits. So this can include having more complex passwords, keeping different passwords for different accounts. This is something participants see as really important in the event that one 
um, one account is compromised or using or trying password manager software. Others include monitoring accounts more, only using trusted sites or trusted payment systems. Again, some participants described this prior, while others only implemented it after these incidents. Being more careful and conscious about sharing information generally. Adding security to a specific account that was compromised. What about just searching Google when something seems like a scam or when a website is unknown or feels off? Several reported this. Finally, being more careful with physical cards and documents. But many other practices are reported by one or two participants, like the George Costanza wallet, pulling on a gas station card reader, being cautious while traveling, and creating new emails for particular websites. So finally, I want to discuss what more could victims do. Even though who, those who identify as vigilant and tech savvy know there's more they can do, and they make conscious decisions about protection. A victim of credit card fraud says, I can tell you there's some cognitive dissonance going on because I'm not as careful as I should be about passwords that I use and such. So they may use secure passwords, but not change them as frequently as they think they should. But alternatively, a big victim of bank and credit card fraud talks about making purchases on sites they perceive as more risky. I do it, but just because it's so cheap, I don't know, I, I don't know, I always feel like some guy knows all my information now. So clearly, many recognize they could do more, but make conscious decisions about risks. So I'll conclude with some themes. First, it's apparent that individuals understand that these are complex issues, and the public understands they have a role in protecting themselves. But further, identity theft can even occur to individuals when they have careful protection strategies in place and are knowledgeable about these issues. Finally, changes in the aftermath vary widely and include some practices that scholars may not even think of um, and may not even ask in traditional surveys. So as such, I believe investigating protection qualitatively can highlight what's important to the participants and what strategies they see as important. There is a lot of information available about online security if somebody were to seek it out, but future research could benefit from examining participants' perspectives to see if the messages and recommendations being sent by government and other agencies align with the messages that the public feels they are receiving. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to discussing, and I've got references available on request. Thank you.